Hello everyone, welcome back to the second part of the theory of English and if you were here for our first part, uh, what we were looking at is the different types of words out there, right? So uh, all the way from nouns to interjections, every word fits into one of these eight types. Um, but what we're going to be looking at for this section is how we can take those words and make intelligible meaning out of them. Uh, how we can make uh, stuff that actually makes sense. So for example, take two words, uh, woman and running, right? So a sentence would never make sense if you just said running by itself because we're asking the question, who is running? Who's doing the action? And the sentence would never make sense if you just said the woman. Um, the woman does what? You know, if you just say the woman, it's just the fact that she exists, but nothing really more. Um, so what we're going to be looking at is our uh, different kinds of clauses, different kinds of ways that an independent clause can be made up, uh, and different sentences that we can make once we've established our independent and our dependent clauses. So that in the end, our final product is going to look something like uh, the woman was running. And that makes sense. Okay, so if you were here for our last video, this is basically where we left off, this big line here, right? So on the left of this line were our types of word, and on the right of this line are our independent and our dependent clause, clauses. Um, independent, and, independent clauses in particular, and dependent clauses, <clears throat> are probably one of the most important things uh, in English, in learning English, right? If you get your independent clause right, um, you basically can say things in the English language, which is really important, right? So, I've put here in uh, red chalk that all meaning comes through independent and dependent clauses. The reason why this is so is because basically because of the example that I gave you at the start of this video, where you have uh, woman and you have running, but it doesn't make sense to say um, the woman just by itself, and it doesn't make sense to say running just by itself. The question that we need to ask is what was the woman doing? The subject has to do something, uh, and, we'll, and the moment that it does, that's what we can call an independent clause. So let's just look at these two uh, for a moment. We have our independent clauses. So basically what an independent clause is, is it stands by itself. It's a sentence, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a thought, a full thought, all by itself, okay? And we'll look at the different types of independent clauses, but that's basically the function of an independent clause. It's a full thought. But what about a dependent clause, right? So a dependent clause <clears throat> is relying on information from the independent clause for it to make sense. Um, I've put here that you can... Um, subordinate a dependent clause to an independent clause using at least two ways. The first way is a relative pronoun, and th this is why I got tripped up in the first video, because the relative pronoun actually uh, does something of the function of a subordinating conjunction in that it introduces an adjectival clause, thereby making it dependent to an independent clause that came before it. So you can use the relative pronoun um, to subordinate your adjectival clause to the independent conjunction, uh, such as that, or such as which, or such as who, or whom. Or you could also use your subordinating conjunction, right? Um, such as however, right? Um, so it, the, the point you really should take away from this when it comes to independent and dependent clauses is that an independent clause can stand by itself. Um, so you could say something like, uh, the boy went to the shops, right? Um, but the moment that you, in you introduce one of these um, features, uh, such as, uh, let's take a subordinating conjunction, for example, you say, um, however, okay, we can use that. Once you say, however, it was closed, um, that doesn't stand by itself, right? You can't just say, however, it was closed, because however implies that something came before to make this sentence meaningful. Uh, but if you didn't have your independent clause, um, nothing came before. So your sentence 
just isn't meaningful. And those are our basic, basic two clauses there. Um, so if we go over here, we can see some of the features uh, of your clauses. What I wanted to point out, firstly, is that the most important, uh, and you should remember this, the most important features of a clause are your subject and your verb, right? The interesting thing about your sub the subject and the verb, right, is that the subject doesn't necessarily mean a noun. It usually does, but it could also it could also be a pronoun, right? It could also be a noun phrase, right? So basically, the subject doesn't necessarily correlate to, um, like for example, one of these. It's not necessarily a noun. Uh, it's not necessarily a pronoun. Uh, it's not necessarily a noun phrase. Uh, it could be any of those things. Really, what we're looking at is what fulfills the function of a subject, what fulfills the function of a verb. That's what you should be looking at, right? So what is the function of a subject? The function of a subject is basically someone that's doing the action. If I say that John went to the shops, John is the subject. If I say that he went to the shops, went is the verb, right? So that's the function of the verb. It's, remember, uh, message. It's movement or state. So who's doing the action? And is it a movement or a state? Once you have these two, you have the minimal requirement for a clause. That's why I put here it's minimum. You have a minimum requirement for a clause. Um, so subject and verb are the most important. If you don't have one of these, if you don't have one of these, you don't have a clause, you might have a phrase, okay? What a phrase is, it's basically a string of words like a clause. However, you can identify it because it will not have a subject and it could just be a verb, or it will not have a verb, and it could just be a subject. So, <clears throat> if we look down here, there's five different types of phrases. Remember that a phrase is a string of words that's similar to a clause, but you have to differentiate them because it won't have a subject, and it just could be a verb, or it won't be a verb, and it will just have a subject. So, <clears throat> remember, Prepositional phrases is the same thing as a preposition, just with more words. So, uh, if I said, if I said, um, John was from Paris, all right, uh, this is an example of a prepositional phrase, right? So, the preposition in that sen in that phrase is from, from where, from Paris. So generally, the rule that we use is that it starts with a preposition and then it ends with a place. And once you have that, it's positioning one object to another. John was from Paris. Okay, that's the prepositional phrase. The verbal phrase, basically, you can basically is dealing with uh, a, a verb in a phrase. Um, so, for example, <clears throat> uh, ran very far would be an example of a verbal phrase, right? Um, a noun phrase, okay? Remember that uh, you can have a phrase that's just a subject, and this would be an example of one. Um, so you could say, the man in the suit could be an example of a noun phrase. Adjectival phrase, um, you could say, the suit which was black, um, would be an example of an adjectival phrase. So the, the trend behind all of these phrases, I hope you can you notice, is that they're really just fulfilling the function of your, you know, your adjectives, your nouns, your verbs. Um, it's just fulfilling the function of those, right? Just in the phrase form, uh, using more than one word. And the adverbial phrases uh, would be describing verbs. Um, <clears throat> So, the man um, ran with all his might, okay? With all his might um, defines which verb ran, okay? So, those are, those, that's a short spiel on phrases. Uh, the thing you should take away is that they'll, they'll never stand by themselves um, in a, as an independent or even a dependent clause, right? Okay? 
The other things we can add on to our clauses are our objects, which are the things being affected by the verb. So we could say, uh, John went to the shops for chips. For what? For chips. That's our object. Uh, so the fourth element of your clauses are your indirect objects, okay? So your indirect objects are basically the things that are being affected by the object. Um, oh, sorry, I got the previous example wrong. So you could say, John, so subject, went to the shops, that's the thing being affected by the verb, for what? For chips, and that would be our indirect object, okay? Now the last one, I don't know if you can read this, it says modifier, okay? And a modifier basically does exactly what, what it says. It modifies, um, it could modify the verb, it could modify the subject, it could modify the object, it could modify the indirect object. A modifier could modify any of these, that's why it's so versatile. So what kind of modifiers do we have? Well, here's five. The adjectival phrase could modify the subject. The adverbial phrase, obviously, could modify the verb. One of the things that I just wanted to point out when you are framing your subject, when you're creating your subject, is just over here, um, you have different persons uh, that you can write your uh, narrative in. And I'm sure you've heard of these, there's three of them. Uh, you got your first, your second, and your third person, and they're pretty easy to distinguish. Your first person basically deals with I, all right? You're referring to yourself. I went to the shops, I did that, uh, I did this. Your second person is referring to your audience, you, okay? So it's like you're instructing your speaker to do things. You go to the shops, you bought this, then you were attacked or something. Your third person is basically um, dealing with your he, your she, your John, your Mary. You're dealing with um, all of the characters at once. You're playing the role of a universal um, narrator, a detached narrator. And that's what your third person is, um, being distinguished from your first and your second person. Okay, and then obviously you can have um, your subjects as singular or you can have them as plural. Right? Uh, that's really something, that's really more for dealing with nouns here. Okay. So here we are <clears throat> at really the meat of it. So if you look to our left, this is where we were before. And that's that, that big line that we were in the first part. We made our way from independent to dependent clauses. We found out what kind of things they could be uh, included in them. And then we have the different types of phrases that we can use, fulfilling the function of our words just with more uh, words. But here are our five independent clauses. Uh, not actually independent. They're, they could actually be independent or dependent uh, clauses. And here are five variations of that. So let's go through them. Subject and verb. You could just have a subject and a verb, and that would be an independent or dependent clause. So, for example, you could say, uh, I ran, okay? I ran. That is an independent clause. I ran is an idea all by itself. Number two, subject, verb, modifier okay so subject verb modifier what could the modifier modify either the subject or the verb doesn't necessarily have to be the verb or the subject but it could be either so you could say the fat man so uh the fat so modifier man subject ran right or the man ran quickly so you you can so I hope you're getting the picture. These five are just being interchanged. You're, you're just mixing them around, right? And the, these are basically all the variations that people have come up with. Subject, verb, object. So remember the object is the thing that the verb affects. So you could say, 
I ran to the shops. Okay, I ran for charity, whatever. Subject, verb, object, modifier. What is the modifier modify? Any of these. I ran to the closed shops. Okay, so the modifier comes in and says, all right, the shops were closed. You can modify the verb, you can modify the subject. So the modifier, remember, is very versatile. Um, not only can you, in, you in, can you include something like an adjective or an adverb, but you could also do them in phrase form as well. So remember, um, more than one word. Subject, verb, object, indirect object. Okay, remember our indirect object? It's what is affected by the object. So we could say, I ran to the shops for chips. Correct? And those are our five clauses. Okay? Over here, I've put different types of mood. And basically, what a mood is, is they are types of um, ways you can take sentences, different types of, um, <clears throat> I guess you could say, purposes of sentences. So in the past, people used three types of mood. So if you can read them, that says indicative, imperative, subjunctive. So indicative basically, an indicative sentence basically means a fact, right? So you could say something like, the sky is blue, would be an indicative sentence. You're indicating that the sky is blue. An imperative sentence describes an order, a command, right? Go get me that spoon. Go fetch me my car. So that, do you see the difference between indicative and imperative, right? Indicative is just pointing out facts. It's blue, this uh, board is green, I'm driving my car. Imperative is ordering people to do things. Um, can you go get me um, my papers, my documents? Subjunctive is different though. Subjunctive is basically dealing with hypothetical situations. Uh, usually your subjunct subjunctive sentences will include a will in them. Um, so you could say, I will, I will um, go get your papers. Or you could also use wish. I wish I had my papers. You know? So these are things that haven't happened yet. You want them to happen. They haven't happened yet. That's why we call them hypothetical um, sentences. You know? Okay. But that was in the past. So this is, from what I understand, I, I don't think I was taught this. But from what I understand, these are your four main um, moods these days. But they're actually quite similar, so it's not, not too hard to get your head around them. Declarative sentences are almost just like your indicative sentences, remember. So they're declaring facts. It is blue, this board is green. Interrogative sentences, so if you remember, our interrogative pronouns here we were asking questions like who did that where are they you know these kind of questions and uh that's basically the same thing for your interrogative sentence it's it's a sentence that's asking a question right so if you could say who is that that's interrogative that's the interrogative mood directive is just like our imperative sentence uh right so our Imperative sentence was, remember, ordering people. So instead of uh, calling it imperative, they call it directive. You know, you're directing people. And our exclamative sentence is basically saying, uh, it's basically something of surprise, right? So that would be similar to um, our interjections right here. So remember, surprise from the start. Well, it is something like that. Uh, with our exclamative sentence. So you could say, he ran so fast, with the exclamation mark. He ran so fast. 
That would be an example of an exclamative sentence. Okay. So we come to the last um, section of this video, at least. And that is the four types of sentence. So remember that up here we were looking at the five different types of clauses you can make. Down here, we're looking at the four different types of sentence you can make. So we're making a distinction between our sentence and our clauses. So basically, once you have down that you can make an independent or a dependent clause out of any five of these, right? Then you can come down here and basically all we're doing is we're doing the very easy job of pairing them up um, um, and seeing which ones make what kind of sentence. So we can start with number one. Our simple sentence just has one independent clause. Okay, so I ran. That's simple, simple sentence. Um, or you could use any any one of these, right? So you could say I ran to the shops, also a simple sentence. So any of these could be independent, right? But what you need is just a one independent clause, okay? So it's similar for number two, compound sentence. You need two independent clauses. Uh, generally in the middle, you would put a correlative, um, not correlative, a coordinating conjunction um, in the middle of them uh, and that would join them up pretty nicely. Um, but just remember, basically one, once you have this down, once you understand that any of these can make an independent clause, then this becomes pretty easy, right? Because literally what you're doing is you're putting two independent clauses together. You might need a conjunction in the middle to make them make sense, um, but, but that's, that's really what a compound sentence is. Complex sentence. Um, one independent clause and one dependent clause. Remember that the way that we can make a dependent clause um, generally is done with a subordinating conjunction, um, such as however. Uh, it's a sentence that, a clause that doesn't stand by itself, okay? And our compound complex sentence, two independent clauses, one dependent clause, Dependent clause can go um, anywhere in that sentence. It can even go at the start of the sentence. Um, it can go in the middle of the sentence. So one independent clause, one dependent clause, one independent clause. The only thing that you need to um, keep track of is that you have two independent clauses, that you have one dependent clause, okay? Um, yeah, and that's basically it. So these, what a sentence is, is basically uh, a variation of your clauses, different ways that you can make sense of your clauses and put them into, um, put them into um, combinations, right? And it, and basically after this, you have intelligible meaning, right? You can, you can now say things, um, and that is, that would be very important when it comes to learning English. Well, that's the end of this video. Uh, if you did watch the whole video, um, I am impressed and uh, very grateful that you did. So thank you for watching the videos. Um, obviously, I don't have all the answers. I'm uh, trying to learn just like you, um, but I am I'm grateful that you're watching these videos. So uh, if you like the videos, would you like, comment and subscribe? And uh, I will see you on the next one.